Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Connor Nigenfind. I have the privilege of serving as one of the pastors at Edgewater Alliance. And if you're new or a guest, welcome, either online or in person. We are glad you are joining us. And I think you picked a good Sunday to join us because today we are starting a brand new series entitled Acts, The Kingdom Advances. And when I'm talking about kingdom advancement, what I want you to understand is I'm talking about things becoming increasingly as they should be. It's very apparent to us as we observe our world that it is broken, that things are not as they ought to be. And the Christian worldview includes this framework that when God created the world, he created it good. And the kingdom of light reigned and humanity was part of God's kingdom heirs, children of the king. And that kingdom was characterized by things like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But there was another kingdom ruled by someone who wanted to be king, namely Satan, who opposed the kingdom of light. And humanity, who was given free will, exercised their free will in rebellion against God, what the Bible would call sin, and aligned itself with the kingdom of darkness that is characterized by quite different qualities than what was uh, than the kingdom of light. And so the kingdom of darkness is characterized by things like greed and pride and lust and racism and anger and injustice and death an eternal separation from God. And when humanity exercised its free will in rebellion against God and aligned itself with the kingdom of darkness, they became slaves of that kingdom. And God, who had free will also, at that point had a choice. Do I try to save those people or do I leave them to deal with the consequences of their choices? And the good news of the gospel is that God looked at us in our mess, in our sin, in our failure, in our rebellion, and says, I still love those people. And that's what we celebrated at Christmas, right? Jesus coming, taking on flesh, going on what we have called the greatest mission trip of all time, coming to earth, showing us what it looked like to be human in the way that God had intended. And his life culminated with a substitutionary death on a cross. That means in your place for our sin, absorbing the consequences that we deserved, Jesus took it upon himself. And Jesus didn't remain dead, but he triumphed over the kingdom of darkness, rising again to life and offering anybody who is enslaved in the kingdom of darkness, which was all of humanity, a get out of jail free card by trusting in Jesus and accepting the gift of salvation that he offers. And the book of Acts, as we're going to be looking at, is this story in a sense of kingdom advancement. And I like how Hugh Halter in his book, Flesh, talks about this subject of kingdom. He notes a kingdom is just a realm of influence where a king reigns. So when Jesus says that his kingdom is now at hand, he's saying the way it is in my perfect heavenly realm can now show up in the realms you experience every day. Jesus' gospel includes salvation of our souls, but that's just the starting point. The kingdom of God means that God is making things right. People get help. They have food on the table, protection from enemies, healing for diseases, and they will get a fresh start. The kingdom means that abuses stop. The poor are cared for, and everyone can be accepted into a community of meaning and substance. For Jesus... It is about the kingdom of his father, bringing heaven to earth, adopting people into the family of God, calling them sons and daughters and friends. In God's kingdom, we are not just people he saves, but fellow heirs of all that the king has. We inherit everything, including the privilege of working with him to see his kingdom win the day. Now that is good news. 
And so the sermon title that we're using to kick off this series is The Adventure Continues. It's a double entendre alluding to the series that we just finished on embracing adventurous faith, as well as an acknowledgement that the book of Acts is a continuation of the book of Luke. So in both senses, the adventure continues. And you might be saying, Connor, enough with this adventure theme. You're obsessed with it. We finished that series, but hear me. We could categorize the book of Acts as an adventure story. And if you don't believe me, that's okay. The ESV Study Bible notes this. The book of Acts is a small anthology of individual literary genres. The list includes hero story, adventure story, travel story, conversion story, and miracle story. It is the report of an adventure, replete with arrests, imprisonments, beatings, riots, narrow escapes, a resurrection from death, a shipwreck, trial scenes, and rescues. There are so many things that are exciting and adventurous in the book of Acts, but I want to say this, that this is not merely a story. It is a history. It is true. It's not merely an allegory that tells a story that contains spiritual truth. This is the history of God's work in and through the early church. And if you're like me, the knowledge of something being true makes you want to lean in. It gives you a greater sense of anticipation. Like if you're watching a movie and before the movie begins, you see the words based on true events. It's like, wow, all the crazy stuff that I'm about to see is based in reality. And the book of Acts isn't merely based in reality. It is history. It's our story of the early church. It was written in the first century AD. I like the date AD right around 62. It was written most likely by Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke, and it is a continuation of that story. And he is a historian. He is concerned with actual events, names, and places. Truth matters. And in a sense, we might do better to think of him not as a historian, but as a journalist. He is writing about things that happened in his lifetime and in the lifetime of his immediate audience so that it would be easier to fact check the writings of Luke, much easier than it would be to to fact check him if he was writing about things in antiquity. If he was making up stuff about the explosion of the early church and the things God were doing, you could just say, we don't see that. We're not happening. But he is writing history, recent history, some of which I believe he was an eyewitness to himself. Others he got from the apostles and recorded for us. The final thing that I'll I'll kind of say, but right before we, we jump into the text, is I want you to understand that if you are here and you've placed your faith in Jesus, you are part of the kingdom of God. And as part of the kingdom of God, you are given a role in kingdom advancement. In the book of Acts is the beginning of the chapter of the church that is still being written by God today. And God is using us, his people. So this is our story, a story that is continuing to being written today with our lives. And so without further ado, if you have your Bible, open it to Acts chapter 1. We are going to be in verses 1 through 14. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, 
But wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power and the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. So if one were trying to kind of summarize the premise of this book, one might say this, that Jesus has risen from the grave and he has ascended to the Father. He has sent out his disciples in the power of the Holy Spirit on mission to advance the kingdom. And one day, Jesus will be returning to reign as king. And so we're in for a lot of action because we're picking up the story after Jesus's ascension and he's commissioning his disciples. He is entrusting them with the mission of kingdom advancement. And so we're in for a lot of action as we go through this book. There's going to be adventures to be had, lives to be changed, missions to be accomplished. And I would bet that these guys at this point in the story are pretty fired up, right? Like team Jesus is doing awesome at this point in the story. Jesus has just risen from the grave and they have been hanging out with him. They were a little nervous. They were a little skittish. They were doubtful just a little while ago, but now they've been hanging out with the resurrected Jesus. Let me ask you something. If you were hanging out with the resurrected Jesus, having breakfast with him on the beach, and and he says, I have some incredible stuff for you to do, some world-changing stuff for you to do, and I want to use you to accomplish it, wouldn't you be pretty fired up? Like, I think I would be really excited, really fired up, extremely confident, not in myself, but in the Jesus who just beat the grave. That is what these guys are dealing with at this point in the story. I would submit to you that they've never been more confident. They've never been more energized. They've never been more passionate than they are at this moment, which makes what happens next feel a little bit awkward, a little bit clunky. They're fired up. They're energized. They're passionate. They should be really ready to go. And the first thing Jesus is telling them to do, the very first part of their mission, we see in verse four. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised. Jesus, are you serious right now? You you just died and came back to life. We are feeling pretty good. Death doesn't really scare us that much anymore. We are on board. We're ready to go. And Jesus says, wait. How many of you enjoy waiting? 
I'm not alone. My family, we have uh, passes to SeaWorld. We love SeaWorld. It's probably our favorite park in Orlando, not because it's the best park per se, but because it has the shortest lines. And we like waiting in short lines. We do not like waiting in long lines, Disney. And uh, I mean, waiting by yourself is, is bad enough, but waiting with three small kids, parents in the room know that's just cruel and unusual punishment, right? So we, we do not like to wait, but when it comes to the significant things in our lives, the things that God has for us in the future, the biggest things, God often uses a season of waiting to prepare us for what lies ahead. And these guys are about to go on the biggest mission of their life. God is about to use these guys to change the world. But you see that there are things that God still wanted to do through these men, in these men rather, before he worked through these men in a new way. There is still work God wanted to do internally in these men and equipping these men before he did more through these men. And so God tells them, Jesus tells them to wait, to wait. And next week, we're going to dive in looking at who they were waiting for and why that's important. And we're going to get there because that is a very major part of this text. But in this series, I hope you join us and I hope you continue to journey with us. There's going to be so much action. There's going to be so much call to action. But I want us to see on the onset that the first thing Jesus tells these men to do is to wait. And I would say this, if you're taking notes, this might be a good one to write down. Failure to wait well often results in failure itself. Failure to wait well often results in failure itself. And so these guys, as fired up as they might have been, After having seen the resurrected Jesus, after Jesus says, I still believe in you guys, still love you guys. I'm sending you guys out to change the world. The first thing he does is he tells them to wait. And I would submit to you that if these guys had ignored Jesus's uh, instruction and would have just charged forward, which you and I at times are inclined to do, right? We want to see results. We want to get things done. We want to go for it. And we have a tendency to run ahead of Jesus. And Jesus tells these men to wait. And if they had ignored his instruction, listen to me, their mission would have failed. They had to wait. God had something for them in the waiting. And you and I want to be people who wait well. When that's the season we're in, we want to wait well. And so in the last few minutes that we have together, I want to just talk about what it looks like to wait well. Some of the best advice that I've had on this subject came from a preacher named Dr. Robert Smith of Beeson Divinity School. And he was preaching one day and I was listening to him and he said, when David was anointed as king by Samuel, there is a period of time between the anointing of David and when David would actually take his place on the throne as king. So there was a gap between the anointing and the appointing. And he said it is David's job between the anointing and the appointing to do everything he could to get ready for the appointment as king. You might be like, king stuff, that's weird. I don't get it. Okay. We had an election in November, and it appears as though there's going to be a transition of power later this month. And I would submit to you that this is not to be vacation time for the president-elect. Rather, it is to be preparation time. He is to be getting ready for the task that he has not yet fully stepped into. And in our lives, this is also true. 
There are things that God often wants to do in and through us in the future. And we find ourselves sometimes in these awkward waiting times and we're like, what do I do? And we want to wait well. We want to do everything. We should want to do everything in our power to prepare us for the things that God may want to use us for in the future. And some of you, you know what I'm talking about when I say waiting. There's this thing in your life that you believe that the Spirit of God has maybe birthed in your desires and in your heart, and yet the timing is not now. It is not yet. But you have this burning desire, this this God-given dream of something that you want to see come to fruition in the future, a ministry you want to have, a relationship you want to have, some impact you want to have, and it's not quite yet. And you're wondering, what do I do? You prepare well. Others of you, you don't even realize that you're in a waiting season and you may very well be. There could be this chance rather that you are in this season where you don't even see it, but right around the corner, God in his sovereignty has prepared a task for you, a mission for you, something significant for you. And he hasn't even revealed to you what that is and you're waiting. And I want to tell you in this time, wait well. Others of you are busy, maybe even really busy with really good things. And as we'll see in the book of Acts, there's seasons of life where God intends them to be busy and you're going and you're doing it and you're having an impact and you're making a difference and you're, you're going, right? It's a due season. But we, co- we use the word season, why? Because seasons come and seasons go. And for many of you, you reflect on your life and you're like, that was a busy season, that was a slow season, that was a preparation season. And, and we have them oftentimes again. And so even if you're here and you're like, I am in a very busy season in my life, I'm doing what God's called me to do, I'm just going for it, understand that there may be a season in your life where you are waiting again. And in that season, you want to wait well. Failure to wait well often results in failure itself. And so I want to give you guys some practical advice on what it looks like to wait well, because we don't want to waste the wait. God doesn't want to waste the wait, so don't you dare waste it either. And here are some practical tips on how to wait well. Number one is grow in your intimacy with Christ. Your relationship with Jesus really matters. And we can, we can fake intimacy. We can pretend we have it. There's no point in that. It's, do you know Jesus? Do you have a vibrant relationship with him? And, and I know emotions come and go, and so I don't want to over-emotionalize it. I think that might be an error. But I do want to say this, that if you don't feel like you have an intimate relationship with Jesus, that's your fault, not his. Right? Like, Jesus came to earth for you. Jesus lived for you, died for you, rose for you, gave his Holy Spirit to you. And he wants you to cultivate intimacy with him. And we do that in a variety of ways. I mean, obviously there's, there's getting into the scriptures and reading the word. It's spending time in prayer. For me, community of being with brothers and sisters in Christ that I know also know, love, and serve Jesus, just being around them just edifies me and makes me love Jesus more. Enjoying things in life and recognizing that he is the giver of every good and perfect gift. So you might be out on a hike and you realize, man, Jesus created this. You're with your kids or your spouse and you're having family time. And Jesus gave me this. Recognizing Jesus is the giver of every good and perfect gift. Cultivate intimacy with Jesus. The second one is to grow in character. 
grow in character. And a couple weeks ago, I was talking about a preparation season I had in college where there was this sin in my life and I needed to deal with it. And it would have been holding me back and hindering me and slowing me down from the things that God wanted to do in and through my life. And so if you are in a waiting season, that is the right time to address areas of character, to repent of sin, to turn away from things that would hold you back from all that God has for you. In John 10, 10, it talks about the thief comes to kill and steal and destroy, being Satan, the enemy. And Jesus says, but I've come so that you may have life and have it to the full. There are things in this life that we think will be fun, that we think will bring us life, that we think will bring us happiness. And they're enslaving and they're bondage and they ultimately lead to death. And Jesus is saying, trust me with this. Lay this sin down. I have come so that you may have life and have it to the full. One of the prayers I've prayed the most in the last couple years is that my character would bear the weight of my influence. And that's a prayer that all of us can pray. All of us have influence and and in waiting seasons in particular, God, what in my character needs to be adjusted? Where do I need to grow? What do I need to prepare for in the inner world in my heart? So take time to grow in character and the power of the Holy Spirit breaks sin patterns, repent. Thirdly, grow in your understanding of God's word. When Brent Crow was here, he he quoted A.W. Tozer, who's most widely attributed with this idea of what you think about God is the most important thing about you. And we recoil from that. We're like, no, no way. But the idea is, is that what you think about God should impact literally every area of your life. And so what we think about God matters. And so in waiting seasons, we need to grow in our understanding of who he is and his heart for other people. And so we want to do things like what you're doing now. We want to be absorbing teaching. We want to be listening to the word, reading the word, getting commentaries, listening to podcasts, reading books, talking to people who have journeyed further with Jesus than you have and who know more about the scriptures than you do. We want to grow in our understanding of God's word. And finally, you want to grow in your love of others. I think there is a temptation that we feel that when we are given a certain platform or a certain opportunity or a certain ministry, then we're going to go love other people. Then we are going to go have an impact. Then we are going to make a difference for Christ. And in the meantime, we just kind of settle into our hobbit holes. We kind of hunker down. We don't really do much. And I I want to remind you, Well, let me phrase this as a question. Jesus walked the earth in flesh for 33 years. How many of those years was Jesus involved in public ministry? Three. Three years of Jesus' 33-year life, Jesus was involved in public ministry, which means that the Son of God appeared to be doing regular things most of the time for about 30 years. But let me ask you something. Do you think the people in Jesus' sphere felt loved? Do you think his friends felt like they had the best friend in the world? Do you think Jesus' small group and his, what we would call a church, just felt loved and blessed by Jesus, his neighbors, his coworkers? Do you think Jesus is lovingly speaking truth into people's lives, helping them out, engaging the mission, making people feel worth and valued and included and and helping the poor and, and standing up for the In ordinary ways, perhaps, 30 of Jesus' 33 years of his life were spent loving people. And so what I would say to you is is if you have this temptation of when this happens in my life, then I'm going to engage the mission. When I'm given this platform, when I'm given this opportunity, no, 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 no. You love people right now. You love your neighbors. 
You love your spouse. You love your kids with the love of Jesus. You love your grandkids. You seek to make Jesus known in your neighborhoods. You want the fragrance of Jesus to exude from your life and people be like, what's up with that woman? What's up with that guy? Why does he love me so much? Why is she so kind? Why are they so honest? Why are they the best neighbors in the world? And as you do that, I believe God is going to grow your love for other people. And he's going to prepare you for the things that lie ahead. And so as I said a little bit ago, Edgewater Alliance Church, we're going to be in this season, and I hope you lean in, where we're looking at kingdom advancement through the book of Acts. But on this first Sunday of this series, I want us to take a breath. Because we want to be people, when the season comes, that wait well. Don't waste the wait. I love you, Edgewater Alliance. Go be the church.